Thanks be to God who has given us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Jesus. We love you so much.
bless you this morning. Thank you so much for tuning in and happy Easter. Praise God. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Amen. Well, let's uh, get our Bibles and get ready to prepare our hearts to take of the Lord's uh, sacraments. I'm going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and I'm going to read uh, beginning with verse 23. That will give you time to go ahead and get your, your elements together so we can take of the Lord's table together. Again, I'm reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 23. The word of the Lord, it reads, For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily should be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that he come not together under condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. If I can, please, I'd like to draw your attention to verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. At this time, I'm going to ask that you would just take a few seconds and bow your heads and look over your walk before the Lord Jesus Christ. And if there's anything in your life that you know of that is uh, unpleasing to God, anything that is contrary to Scripture, contrary to the gospel. I would ask that you would go before the Father and make things right as we get ready to take of the Lord's Supper. And Father, we just bless you and we honor you this morning. Father, we thank you for this beautiful Resurrection Sunday. And Father, we come now acknowledging our sins as a corporate body. Father, you said in your word that if any man sins, he has an advocate with the Father. And Father, we know that Jesus Christ is our advocate. And so, Father, we come asking that you would forgive us of all of our sins, known and unknown, committed and omitted. And Father, by faith, we believe that that's done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, you can take your bread, get your bread in your hand. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. We may all eat together. You can get your cup. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We may all drink together. Father, we just thank you this morning for our new covenant rights that have been sealed in the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for your grace that you demonstrate towards us as your children. And Father, we're so appreciative of everything that you have done, everything that you're doing, and everything that you have in store for us. And Father, we, we thank you and we bless you this morning. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me, whom the sun sets free, oh, his 
Resurrection Sunday to you this morning. Um, this morning I'm going to talk with you about the power of the cross. The power of the cross. When Jesus uh, hung on that cross, he hung between two thieves. And uh, as he hung on that cross, we see that he preached the gospel to one of the thieves. And they gave their life to the Lord. We also see that when Jesus hung on that cross, he demonstrated to you and I how we are to handle our own individual crosses in our own walk with him. There's three simple facts about Easter, three very simple facts about Resurrection Sunday. The first fact is that the tomb of Jesus Christ is empty. The second fact is Jesus is alive, seated at the right hand of the Father. And the third fact is that people continue to disbelieve those two facts I just mentioned to you, even as I stand before you this morning. His tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. And we still have people today who don't believe those two factual points I just made. But this morning, I want you to turn with me over to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. And I'm going to begin with verse 33. Now, here's the situation with this text, I'm going to give you a little background about my text that I'm getting ready to read. Jesus is nailed on the cross between two thieves. He hung on the cross from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. He was on that cross. And while he was nailed to that cross, he saved a man. He preached the salvation message and he saved a man. And he demonstrated to us and he had taught us or he taught us how we are to handle our own individual crosses and our own journey with him. So let's look at this Luke chapter 23, beginning with verse 33. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, if thou be king of the Jews, say thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, if thou be Christ, say thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, 
Does not thy fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou cometh into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now, there's four points I want to pull out of this particular teaching here. Uh, the first point is, if we don't understand that we are sinners, then we won't see a need for a savior. Let me say that again. If you don't understand that you are a sinner, then you will never see the need for a savior. In verse 42, one of the male factors said this. He said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou cometh into thy kingdom. The first thief didn't understand that he was sinful. But the second thief understood that he was being crucified in the midst of a holy God. That's why the second thief, he asked Jesus, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into thy kingdom. And he also asked the first thief, he said, don't you fear God? He said, you and I are receiving what we have come into us. But he said, this man hasn't done anything wrong. He said, in essence, this man is hanging on the cross, ready to give up his life. Surely he has to be who he says that he is. And so the second man understood that he was a sinner and that he was being uh, uh, crucified in the midst of a holy God and he asked the other thief he said do you not fear God one of the things that we're missing right now in our culture and in the church is the fear of God we are missing the reverence of God now by fear of God I'm not talking about where you are afraid that God's going to harm you or hurt you. I'm talking about a respect whereby you respect the fact that there is a sovereign God in control of everything. We're missing it in our culture and we're missing it in the church. The Bible says in Psalms 33 verse 8 NIV translation, let all the earth fear the Lord and let all the people of the world revere him. There used to be a time when I was growing up when you would have uh, the folks around who didn't go to church, who cussed like sailors, you know, who would drink you under the table, but now they would not use the Lord's name in vain. He would not, they would not use God's name in vain. And they'd tell you in a minute, I don't play with God. Now these folks didn't live for God but they tell you in a minute, I don't play with God. They had a healthy respect for who God is. And this is what we're missing in the culture right now. We're missing it in the church as well. And we're missing it with our youth. This is why you can have a young man who would rather just shoot you than look at you. Or they'll take your life with some tennis shoes. Or they will just go into these schools and, and shoot up the schools. Some of it's mental health. And then some of it just the fact that people... Do not fear the Lord. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. 
but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, the, the text says this, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if the first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Verse 18, NIV translation says, And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what would become of the ungodly and the sinner? Paul, in instructing us to have a healthy uh, respect for God. In essence, Paul is saying that we need to take God seriously. And one of the problems we're having right now in our culture and in the church is that we do not take God seriously. And this male factor, he asks the other thief that was hanging on the cross with them. He said, do you not fear God? And one of the problems we have when it comes to people giving their lives to Christ is the fact that they don't see the need that they have to give their life to Christ because they don't really recognize that their lifestyle is wrong. They don't recognize that sin is wrong. And so unless you recognize that sin is wrong, unless you recognize that you are a sinner, you will never see the need for a savior. And then the second point is this. The first thief didn't understand who he was dying next to. But the second thief did. So the second point is this, and that is, if we don't understand who Jesus is, we won't respond to him correctly. Let me say that again. If we don't understand who Jesus is, then we won't respond to him correctly. Now, Luke chapter 23, verse 41, the text says, and we indeed justly for we received the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. This mere factor did not understand who Jesus was. He did not understand that Jesus was God in the flesh. And my second point is very clear, and that is, if we don't understand who Jesus is, then we will not respond to Jesus correctly. And a lot of people they know about Jesus, they've heard about Jesus, but they truly don't understand who Jesus is. And so because they really don't understand that Jesus is God in the flesh, they don't respond correctly to Jesus. See, once you understand who he really is, then you respond to him correctly. Once you understand that Jesus is the son of the living God, that he is the savior of the world. Once you truly understand that, and not by uh, academic understanding, but by revelation, then you respond to him. See, a lot of people know who Jesus is, but they know who he is by way of academics. They have not yet had a true uh, revelation that Jesus is the son of the living God. And the reason we can say that, or the reason I can say that, is because they have not responded to him correctly. See, we must understand when we say that Jesus was just a prophet. And you do have people who say that Jesus was a prophet. Yes, Jesus was a prophet. But you must understand if you just say that he was just a prophet. A lot of people misunderstand when they say that Jesus was a good man. Yes, he was a good man. He did good deeds. But you truly don't have a revelation of who Jesus is if you just see him as a good person. He was more than just a good person. Some people just see Jesus as a good teacher. He was a good uh, a teacher of the, of, of the text, of the law. Yes, he was a good teacher. But you misunderstand and you don't really have a true revelation of who Jesus was was or who he is if you just come to the conclusion that he was a good teacher because he was more than just a good teacher he was more than just a prophet he was more than just a good person see we misunderstand when we don't realize that Jesus is the son of the living God 
And even as I stand before you this morning, there are people who will tell you he was a prophet, he was a good person, he was a teacher of the law, he, he, he was a good person. But they will not accept the fact that he was God in the flesh. And when you don't have that revelation about who Christ is, then you will not respond to him correctly. First Peter chapter two, verse 24, the New Living Translation, the text says, he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. Jesus bore our sins and our sicknesses on his body on that cross. He was crucified for our sins. He was crucified for our transgressions. But that does not come by just hearing it. It comes by hearing it and getting a revelation of what that really means. And only one of the male factors on the cross had that revelation. And you heard me say earlier that Jesus preached the gospel and a man gave his life to Christ on the cross. And what I mean by Jesus preaching the gospel, I mean that he demonstrated not by words, but by his actions. He did what I would like to refer to an illustrated sermon on that cross. And because he died on that cross, he did an illustrated sermon and one of the male factors gave their life over to Christ. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Uh, the third point I want to make is this, and that is the second man believed that there was going to be a resurrection. And so if you do not believe in the resurrection of Christ, then you can't benefit from the resurrection. Let me say that again. The third point I want to make is this. If you do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then you cannot benefit from the resurrection of Christ. The second thief believed that there was going to be a resurrection. My question to you this morning is, are you confident that Jesus was raised from the dead? Now watch what the uh, second thief says in verse 42. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou cometh into thy kingdom. Now, if you're getting ready to die, but you're still coming into a kingdom, then obviously you plan on getting up. So this second thief believed in the resurrection. Now here, again, if you don't believe in the resurrection, you can't benefit from the resurrection. And this is the issue today. So many theologians and so many different uh, religions try to discredit the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that puts Christianity in a category all by itself. That's what makes Christianity different from any other religion. And that is that Jesus Christ died, went to hell, and on the third day was raised from the dead. And he's now seated at the right hand of the Father. And his tomb is empty and he is alive. People have been trying to discredit the resurrection ever since it happened over 2,000 years ago. You can read in the text where they try to say, well, they stole the body or they came and changed the body or something happened. Even today, they try to discredit the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They need to discredit the resurrection of Jesus Christ because if they don't discredit the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then Jesus is in a category all by himself. And that is what puts Jesus in a category all by himself. It is his resurrection. And people today try to discredit the resurrection. Now, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and verse 4. The Apostle Paul says this, For I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures. Verse 4, And that he was buried, and that he rose again 
the third day according to the scriptures. Paul said that Jesus Christ died, buried, and he rose again according to the word of God. Now, there are people today who don't believe in the resurrection. There are people today who will not accept that Jesus is the Son of God. But the second thief understood what a lot of people still don't understand today and, will, will, and still will not accept today. And that is you and I are saved by grace. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 the text says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Verse 9 says, Not of works, lest any man should boast. And so this second malefactor, this second thief, he understood and he accepted the fact that there was going to be a resurrection. And he understood that you and I are saved by grace. That is not by human accomplishments. It's not by human effort. Now I want to pick up at John chapter 19, verse 30 through verse 36. Verse 30, the text says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation and the bodies should not remain up on the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he said true, that he might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. Now, this is John's uh, uh, telling the story about uh, Jesus hanging on the cross, being crucified on the cross. And he's telling it a little bit differently than Luke. Now, John says that because of um, uh, the Sabbath day, that they wanted to hurry up and get these guys off the cross. They wanted to get the two thieves and Jesus off the cross because they didn't want their bodies hanging up there on the cross during the Sabbath day. And so they asked permission from Pilate to break their legs. Now, the reason they wanted to break their legs so they could hurry up and die on the cross because what would happen is when they put a person on the cross to be crucified, that person could delay death by pushing their weight up off the nails and resisting the pain and slowing down their death. But because of the Sabbath day, they didn't want the bodies on the cross and they wanted to hurry up and hasten their death. So they asked for permission to break their legs because if they break their legs, then they can't push up off the cross by pushing, the, uh, pushing their weight by moving their weight up off the nails and, and, and delaying their, their death, if you will. And so if they break their legs, it means they would have to go ahead and submit to the cross and go ahead and submit to death. And so when they get to the first male factor, they break his legs. They get to the second male factor, they break his legs. And by breaking their legs, they have to go ahead now and submit to the cross and submit to death. Now, I want you to look very closely at John 19, verse 33, because this is key. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. Now, two important points that I want to bring out here. First is this. 
Had they broken the legs of Jesus, they would have messed up the typology of Jesus because Jesus had to be a lamb without broken bones or blemishes in his body. John the Baptist says this in John chapter 1, verse 29. Behold, the Lamb of God would taketh away the sins of the world. So the first thing is, had they broken his legs, had they broken the legs of Christ, they would have messed up the typology of Jesus Christ. And the second point is this, and that is, they didn't have to break the legs of Jesus because Jesus became obedient even to the cross even to the death on the cross. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through verse 8, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took up on him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. Verse 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, Jesus is teaching us how to deal with the cross and the crosses that we have to bear in our own daily walk with him. Now, all of us have our own unique crosses that we have to bear in our journey with Jesus Christ. All of us have our own individual crosses we have to take up as we walk out and work out our salvation with fear and trembling. This is why Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, what Jesus was saying in essence is, whatever you see happen to me, you can expect to happen to you. The problem that we have in the body of Christ is that some folks still think that God's talking about a cross made out of wood. That's not the type of cross that you and I are going to have to bear. All of us are going to have to bear our own crosses, but the crosses we're going to bear is not going to be made of wood. We all have our own unique special crosses that we have to bear as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling with the Lord. Now, Jesus is teaching us through his demonstration on the cross that when we have a cross to bear, that we are not to pull up off the nails. We are to just submit to the cross. We are to submit to his will. Jesus submitted to the will of the Father. Yes, he cried out. Yes, he was in agony. Yes, he asked the father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for him. But he also said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And so Jesus is teaching us that when we have to bear our own individual crosses as we sojourn with him, that we are not to pull up off the nails. We are not to fight the cross. We are to submit to the cross. We are to submit to the will of God. Stop feeling sorry for yourself and die. Stop being so depressed and die. Stop being so frustrated and die. Stop being so irritated and, and die. Submit yourself to the cross. Submit yourself to what God allows to stand up in your life. A cross is anything that God allows to stand up in your life to kill your will, to kill your pride, and to kill your flesh. Some of you this morning, your cross could be a child that you have poured everything into. And that child still does not appreciate anything you've done and have broken your heart and has disappointed you. But yet you poured everything you could into that child. That could be your cross. Your cross could be your wife who does not understand you. You may have cried out to God, Lord, give her understanding. Allow her to see who I am. Allow her to understand the person that I am. Allow her to look past my past mistakes. Allow her to understand and to see that I am not the same person, that I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make this situation work. Lord, allow her to see that. That could be your cross. Your cross could be that you have a husband who doesn't appreciate you. 
who have, who you have a husband who does not really love you the way you want to be loved. And you're crying out to God, Lord, this man doesn't appreciate me. He doesn't love me. He does not show up affection towards me. That could be your cross. Your cross could be a situation whereby you are misunderstood on your job or you're misunderstood by your family members. And now you're feeling like the black sheep of the family or the black sheep on the job. And you feel like people are just taking advantage of you. And you just don't have the, the, the boldness to speak up. That could be your cross. Anytime you pray for something fervently, for God to remove out of your life and God doesn't remove it, that means that God's using it to get some glory out of your life. The Apostle Paul puts it like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through verse 9. I'm reading out of the NIV translation. Paul says, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. He says in verse 8, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Verse 9, he says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. And my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul had one of those situations in his life, a cross that God allowed to stand up in his life that was killing his flesh. God will allow things to come into your life to kill your pride, to kill your own determined will, to kill your flesh. And he won't take it away. And anytime he allows it, he's doing it to get some glory out of your life. Paul said, I prayed three times that the Lord would remove this thorn in my flesh. And God responded and said, my grace is sufficient for my power is made perfect in weakness. And so just like the Apostle Paul, there are times when you and I have our own crosses that we have to bear, even though we want God to remove those crosses. And God says, no, my grace is sufficient. And let me say this, don't make fun of other people's crosses. Don't uh, point out other people's crosses. Don't gossip about other people's crosses. Don't allow yourself to belittle somebody else's cross because you don't know their story. You don't know what God is doing in their own individual walk. But you should know and you should be aware that we all have our own crosses to bear. And Jesus taught us on the cross himself. He demonstrated on the cross that we are to just submit to that cross Submit to the will of God and let God's will be done in our lives. Don't let the enemy talk you out of getting up off your cross. Don't let the enemy tell you, you don't have to put up with this anymore. You don't have to take this. Don't let the enemy talk you into getting down off the cross. So many folks are on their cross. God's doing something in their lives, in their situations, but they just, they got to get up off the cross. They just can't take it anymore. So they just get up and come down off the cross without realizing that if you can't take the cross, you're not gonna get a crown. If the enemy can talk you down off your cross, he's talked you out of your crown. No cross, no crown. A lot of us, we want the crown, we just don't want the cross. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 12, Paul says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. There are going to be times when you and I are going to have to put up with some things that we just don't want to put up with. And it's going to happen because of the cross. It's going to happen because of our life with Christ Jesus. Some people are just not going to like you because you are righteous. Some things are going to happen in your life because you are righteous. There's going to be forces that are going to come against you because you are righteous. Darkness does not like light. But even at that stage in your walk or even at that point in your walk when you see that you have been persecuted um, for righteous sake then count it as as a a, a, a gift from God count it as um, a, a, a badge of honor that you've been persecuted for the gospel's sake now 
The Bible says this as I close. The Bible makes it very clear that Jesus died on the cross for you and I and for all humanity for two reasons. The first reason is to demonstrate the, the love that God has for humanity. Let me say that again. The Bible makes it very clear why Jesus Christ died on the cross. And one of the reasons Jesus Christ died on the cross was to demonstrate the love that God has for you and I and all humanity. Romans chapter 5 verse 8, the Amplified reads like this, but God shows and clearly proves his own love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, died for us. And then the second reason Christ died on that cross for us was to pay the price for our sins, for the sins of all humanity. Now, understand, when you break a law, you have to pay a penalty. Anytime a law is broken, a penalty has to be paid. If you break a man's law, you have to pay man's penalty. If you break God's law, you have to pay God's penalty. The Bible makes it very clear that the wages of sin is death. And so because man broke God's law all the way back in the garden, a penalty had to be paid. And Jesus paid that penalty for you and I. And that penalty was the blood of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 2 verse 21 as I close says, says this, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and for me and for anyone who would accept him as savior that we might be redeemed from the curse of the law and from the fall of Adam in the garden. He demonstrated the love for the Father for us and he paid the price for our sins. This is what Easter is about. This is what Resurrection Sunday is about. It's about a God who came to earth, became a man, who died, went to hell, and rose again. And he did so to demonstrate his love that he has for his creation. Amen. Thank God for the resurrection. <laughs> Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for his grace. Let's pray. Father, we just bless you and we honor you this morning. We thank you, Father, for sending your son to die for our sins. And Father, we thank you that because of the love that you have for us, that all who desires can spend eternity with you. And we thank you for this. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you this morning. I hope you enjoy this beautiful Resurrection Sunday. Look forward to ministering to you next week. Amen. God bless you. Praise God. You just heard a wonderful, we just heard a wonderful message. The power of the cross, Resurrection Sunday. Praise God. If you're out there in our viewing audience, you just heard a wonderful message. And if you don't know Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity to invite him into your life. The scriptures say, if I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So I want to give you that opportunity to invite Jesus into your life. 
and to acknowledge that I need a savior. You know, I had to acknowledge that one day myself. I needed a savior and I need him now. I need it every day of my life in these times that we live in. And so I want to give you that opportunity and I view an audition. And if you'll just follow along after me or just quote after me, we're going to do this simple prayer. And I want to uh, uh, give you that opportunity. And that just repeat after me. Jesus, I'm sorry for all my sins. I invite you into my heart and ask you to forgive me of all my sins and to wash me clean in your precious blood. I believe you died for my sins and I believe you rose from the grave. And I ask you into my heart by faith. I receive you now. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my heart and forgiving me of all my sins. I pray and ask of you to help me from this day forward to live for you. I thank you for coming into my heart and being my Lord and Savior. Amen. God bless you, my friend. And if you prayed that simple prayer, you can thank God from this day forward. Go some, go in, and in your little book or somewhere, jot it down. Write it down that this is the new day for me that I've given my heart to Jesus Christ. And from this day forward, I'm a new creature in Christ. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a person that's saved, been forgiven of my sins. And I just want to tell you, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And the angels of heaven are rejoicing this day because you've given your heart to Jesus. Amen and God bless you. We're going to go right into our offering and I thank God uh, for this Resurrection Sunday. And I want to read a few verses of scripture out of the book of Mark, the 12th chapter and the 41st verse. And it reads, and Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow and she threw in two mites which make a far thing. And he called unto his disciples, Jesus did, and said unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance. But she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. And I just want to speak to you out there and I view an audience. Sometimes you might say, I don't have anything to give. You can't afford not to give. Jesus is telling this story about this widow who came to the temple she didn't know that the Lord and Savior was going to be at the temple this day. But God, God knows how to be on the scene to recognize you for what you are sowing into the kingdom. And Jesus called the disciples aside and said, this widow threw in two mites. And if you look at the, uh, the interpretation of it, she threw in two pennies. And Jesus took note of her giving more so than all those rich men that were thrown into the treasury, that was casting their money into it. Why did Jesus take note of this two pennies, these two pennies? Well, one of the things is said, she cast in of her want. In other words, she had a need, but uh, uh, her need did not outweigh her desire to sow. You know, and I've often heard preachers say, if you got a need, and your seed don't meet your need, the best thing to do is sow it. And I tell you what, this widow uh, 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 did just that. She sowed that two uh, 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 mice into the treasury. And Jesus recognized her giving and said that the quality of her giving uh, uh, was uh, far above or uh, exceeded all the money that was being cast in because by those that were rich because she had a need she needed the money but she decided to sow it into God's kingdom into the house of God and so what am I saying to you out there in our viewing audience you say I don't really have much to give so what do you have 
sow it. One thing about God, whatever you give to the kingdom over there in the book of uh, Ecclesiastes, it said, cast thy bread on the water. Not many days hence, it's going to return unto you. And one of my old preacher friends used to say, it's going to come back French toast. Well, God know how to bless you. He know how to take that seed you sow, which you uh, 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 sowed into the kingdom and know how to multiply it and even give you a bigger harvest than that you sowed. So I want to encourage you, never think that what you're giving is too little or too much to give. God recognize the little seed as well as he do the big seed. And I want to encourage you to give. You know, this is Resurrection Sunday. This is the Sunday that we celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you to get your best seed that you can sow and sow it as a resurrection seed along with the offering. Do you take out, a, uh, if you have, you say, I'm going to dedicate this resurrection seed in reference to the fact that my Lord and Savior rose from the grave. And that's what we'll celebrate, you know, the death and burial and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. The scriptures say he was the first fruit of the resurrection. In other words, his rising from the grave is a testimony to all of us who will one day have to leave here. But we can know of a surety, but we're going to rise again one day. One day we're going to step up out of that grave just like our Lord and Savior did uh, because this is a resurrection Sunday. He rose from the grave. And so I want to encourage you, get your best offering that you have and say, I'm going to sow a resurrection seed into the kingdom of God. And I want to assure you that when you sow your seed, God is going to bless you. The same way God took note of this widow who sowed the two mice, he's also going to take note of you sowing your regular seed as well as a resurrection seed. Amen. God bless you. And we're going to pray for you. We're going to uh, pray and believe God blessing to be upon the seed you sow. And now you can look at the bottom of the screen and it tells you the various ways that you can sow into this ministry. And I just want to pray and believe God along with you that God's blessing is going to be on the seed you sow. And God is going to give you a harvest from the seed you sow today. That resurrection seed and that regular seed that we're encouraging you to give. Amen. God bless you. Father, I thank you for all those in our viewing audience. And I thank you for those who had a desire in their heart to give unto the kingdom of God. And to even give a resurrection seed. A seed aside from their regular giving, but a seed in, as in commemoration of the fact that our Lord and Savior, this day we celebrate, rose from the grave. So I pray now, Father, that the blessings of God that maketh us rich and add no sorrow to our life be upon the, those that who make this sacrifice to sow into the kingdom of God. I thank you now. I break every assignment of the wicked one to withhold the blessings of God over their finances and over their household. Your word tell us, Father, that you will bless us Going in the city, coming out of the city, you will bless our pocketbook, our storehouse. You will bless the very fruit of our womb. And I touch and agree with all those in our viewing audience that the blessing of God will be upon their giving and will be upon their life henceforth and from this time forth and forever. In Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. God bless you, my friend. And God, thank you for a sowing a resurrection seed and given in their offering. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We thank you for your giving and thank you for tuning in to the broadcast and hearing this powerful message. And we thank God for you. And we're just going to pray and believe God that throughout this, the rest of this year, that the blessings of God be upon your life and your family. Father, we thank you for all those that have tuned in to hear this broadcast and 
uh, continually tune in to hear the services. And we just thank you for them and we just touch and agree with all those in our viewing audience that the power of God will rest upon them and their families and loved ones. That your spirit will keep them safe from this pandemic. That you would garrison around them and let no weapon form against them prosper. And every tongue that would rise against them in judgment, thou shalt condemn. We pray right now, Father, not only that you would keep them, but if they are dealing with any issues, that that spirit of uh, 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 poverty will be broken, that spirit of lack will be broken off of, and that spirit of infirmity of sickness will be broken right now in Jesus' name. And we thank you that the healing virtue of our Lord and Savior will flow through their bodies right now from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. And that you would uh, uh, keep them this throughout this year. In Jesus' name we pray. And God bless you, my friend. And thank you for tuning in.